Excellent. First and foremost, thank you folks for having me. Like I, I love hanging out. And like I said, I actually came to this meetup before in person back when we could do things together. So it's really good to be back with everyone. Now, as soon as you can see my screen, give me a thumbs up. Just let me know that we're in the building. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. So my name is Mark Thompson. And as well, so I only said, yeah, I work at Google. I'm on uh, the Angular team. And yeah, I work in developer, developer relations, which for me is a really great opportunity to do the things that I love to do, which I love to code, but I also love to teach and to find a role that does both of those together was really a very special uh, kind of circumstance that I was able to, to do that. So I'm really happy to be here and to hang out with you folks. All right, friends, let's get this party started. All right, so first and foremost, I wanna introduce you to someone, our main uh, catalyst here. This is my kid. And I call him the air. So if you follow me on Twitter, you've heard me say something like, oh, the air does this, the air does that. That's because I say jokingly and lovingly that he is the heir to the Thompson fortune. However, there is not a Thompson fortune because with kids, you know that you don't actually have any money left when you have kids. So he doesn't know that he's not going to get anything at the end of this thing. But, you know, <laughs> I like to keep it going. But here's what he said to me the other day that was really interesting. He said, hey, dad. I want to reuse my Angular skills. I know I'm three, but I want to reuse my Angular skills to make mobile apps, right? And of course, any parent yeah, knows you say, is that how we ask for things? Is that how we talk to each other? And he says, please, he wants to know how to use his Angular skills to make mobile apps. All right, now that's a lot better. So let's actually talk about that because that's a really um, interesting question. So why would you even consider Angular for mobile at all? We already know that the mobile space is, there's lots of solutions there. So what would make mobile development in Angular even be interesting to talk about? And I'm gonna tell you why I think this is interesting. So first let's talk about mobile development. And if anyone here, if you can just give me a thumbs up if you ever built a mobile app or worked on a team that built a mobile app. Yeah, so you know a lot of this stuff. You know that the cost is pretty high for building a mobile app. If you get contracted to do one, you can say it's somewhere between 15,000 to 100,000, right? Or more, and that really depends on a few things. Like what type of app do you want to develop? Is it social media? Is it an Uber clone? Is it something else? Then there's the other thing is the time that it takes, no matter what solution you go for, you will feel like you'll go through that uh, graph where it shows you the high productivity, and then there's the, the little trough of sorrow that you go through, and then that's where you really get productive. So that time though, that time frame is somewhere between one to nine months. Again, development is unpredictable, so you actually don't know what's gonna happen in that process. And then here's the other thing is personnel and your teams. So you may have, you may need to have web teams, you may need to have iOS teams, you may need to have Android teams. So as you're thinking about this, you have all of these considerations to take in to take in mind. All right. So here's where I think this solution with and with Angular is really interesting because first you think about reuse of skills and people love this, right? Because you think about the fact that if you can reuse the skills that you already have, you don't have to hire new people potentially and you don't have to upskill people. They can take those new skills and just augment them with new information and get things going. Uh, pretty quickly. And I think engineering teams and engineering managers love this idea just because if I can reuse what, we are, what we've already developed in-house in terms of skills, that's going to be a win for us. Then there's reuse of code. Now, since the early days of my programming career, okay, I've been in the industry for over 15 years at this point, and I still remember the first time I understood what the promise of Java was, right, in the early days, before it was the enterprise behemoth that it is where it has, and the JVM has taken a life of its own. The idea of Java was what? You could reuse your code. You could write runs, run everywhere. And that was a really compelling reason. And even now, right, since then, we're still chasing this. We're still chasing the reuse of code. And so that's also a really competitive, uh, compelling thing because if you can reuse any code, you can get to where? To market, you can get there faster. Then reuse of teams. I touched on this before, but again, there's this idea that if you could reuse the personnel that you have and take their skills that they already have and the code they already have, you don't have to augment your staff too much. That's going to be a win. Your business uh, partners and stakeholders are going to love this idea that you can uh, reuse the teams that you have. And then your teams are going to really be really excited to potentially learn some new things while reusing those skills that they already have. So that's what 
the promise is when you look at something like an Angular to do mobile application development. Because if you look at reuse of code, reuse of uh, skills and reuse of teams, well, if I'm an Angular developer and I have web skills, can I use those to make a compelling web experience? And so here's the app that we're gonna explore this idea through. So we're gonna use this app, uh, it's called Health Notes. And all it does is it allows you to keep track of like little notes as you're leading up to a doctor's appointment. So let's say that I have, you know, I, I was put on a different diet. I can keep notes until my follow-up. And then I can share those with my physician, okay? And we're gonna, gonna use this as our core app that we'll look at across our different solutions across the journey. So our story is gonna play out in three parts, okay? And, and each of these solutions is gonna have its benefits and then it's negatives. And I wanna be as, as objective as I can about this because what's really important is that you're able to choose a good solution. You really care about the solution, right? That's gonna work for you and your team. So first, we're gonna start our story looking at PWAs. Now, PWAs allow us to use technology, right? That we already know, but take it past the initial interaction in the browser. And let's talk about what that actually means. PWAs are progressive web apps and you want your application, when we say progressive, it means you can also have progressive enhancement, meaning that it gets better over time. All right, so these are applications that can be installed on desktop or mobile. Think about the website that we just showed. Well, it'd be great if we can get this thing from the web onto like a mobile phone or onto our desktop. And here's a great aspect of it. It's built with web technology. So we're hoping to use our JavaScript slash TypeScript, HTML and CSS skills to, uh, to, to build these applications. And then here's what's really, really important is the idea that there is more than just this, oh, there's an icon shortcut on my phone or on my desktop. We, we wanna move past that. We actually wanna create an engaging experience that works offline and then has access to really advanced browser APIs as the web moves forward. So now here's where I think Angular's, because remember Angular is our core technology. So how does Angular work in PWAs? Well, Angular has first class supports for PWAs. And the way that we do it is we use the ng command, which is the Angular CLI. We say add, and then we just add this package, Angular slash PWA. Now let's look Hello, go back. There we go. Okay, so here's the application that I was just describing to you. You know, we have some parts to it, like our, we have some components, okay? And if I just were to run this, I can do ng, or we'll make this bigger so you folks can see at home. Okay, so if we just wanna run this, we do ng serve, right? And then this should run our application. And then I'm gonna open it up in our browser right next to, right next to it. So this is gonna start up my local development server. So in case you haven't used Angular before, uh, our tooling is one of the things that we love the most. And the thing that it's gonna give me is my local web server and I can run this on localhost 4200. So let me just head right over there and we should see this working right now. Okay, so here's our application being served locally right here. Um, I have a little navigation menu. All right, with some, some details there. And then I can get into my app and then if I want to get started, let's just say that I, I had a runny nose, right? So this is what, then I can save my note. You can see the time and I can add another one. Um, so I'll still feel bad after eating some oatmeal. So we'll say that as well. All right, so I can show these notes with my doctor. Now, here's where the magic comes in. So I've already installed the PWA support in this application. I've already done the ng add. And if you want to see, so, and it'll tell me if I try to add it again, it'll just warn me that I've already installed it. Okay. And what I'm going to do now is now that I have my PWA support, see all my files already exist for configuration. So we're already set. So let me just do an ng build and I want to do a production bundle uh, for this. Now uh, this dash dash prod that's going away in our next release where we're just going to assume that if you say ng build, you want a production bundle so you don't by accident deploy, you know, a development bundle with like all your extra non uh, tree shaking code. All right. 
One of the things that we're going to see is once we get our PWA uh, bundle built, I'm going to serve it. And then we're going to just confirm all the like promises that I've made about how it can work. All right. So, so our bundle is built. I'm going to use a tool called serve, which is a, like a, a web server, right? I'm going to use my, my serve tool and I'm going to serve the, the NG mobile app. Okay, great. All right, so we are going to, it's already in my clipboard. That, that's what serve does really well for me. Here's what's really cool. So I'm gonna open up the Chrome Dev Tools, then go to application. And what I wanna see, here's what I want to see, right? That my PWA is working. And the reason I know this is working because of this technology called a service worker. And the service worker is, what does all the magic behind the scenes with the PWA is how it's able to work offline and a lot of stuff. And I wanna show you exactly that. So we have a service worker working. Now I'm just gonna go offline with the application. Now here's, what's, here's where things get awesome with PWA as a solution. So when I refresh, oh, I didn't include my image in my bundle. Oh, that's okay. That we can we can we can fix that. That's no problem. But what I really wanted to show, I don't know if this is gonna show up because of the dark thing, but if you look, we have our service worker, which is serving things that we need, like our run our build uh, our build bundles here, right? So the service worker itself is actually serving that for me. And if I configured it properly, I would be able to have. Can I fix that real quick? Let's see. I'm gonna go to my ng, and so this isn't necessarily a service worker talk, but I can configure what are the things that should be uh, cached, right, and made available. So if you look at my my app here, I didn't include one of my images, which is why that header image is missing. So we can actually do that in real time, and just make sure that we have that working. So if we look, we should get so we got our JS, and I think we can do slash. Uh, star star dot png. Uh, wait, and then we do this. Star at png. I believe if I do this and rebuild that, so I would update this file which says which assets to cache, so that way it can be served by the service worker. I would update it like this to say, hey, make sure you get my images. And of course, I'm including all of them on line 15. But as you create a more custom build with your service worker, you'd really want this thing to be specified to the things that are necessary and not just all images, okay? So you can get very specific here. Awesome, all right, so we got our service worker working, our PWA is working, and we know that it's working offline because I just showed you it's working offline because I can still go to get started even though I'm offline, like this is still working. Okay, so that's working in our favor. But here's where things get really interesting. So let me stop this. Now, the other part of the story is that it should be it should be uh, installable, right? It should be installable. So if you wanna have some fun, let's have some fun. Let's, say, let's do ng add, and we're gonna add Angular Fire. This is support for Firebase in Angular. And what we're gonna do is actually deploy the application, and then you can install the application right now and confirm that it's actually installable on your phone, just like an app. And I'm gonna show it as well on this, uh, on the screen. So right now it's just installing all the packages while it's doing that. Let me get my device ready. All right, so that's going. So I'm gonna grab my, my device. So I need this thing. Can I get this? Where are you? Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna bring this over to the desktop that we're working on. Okay, so this is my actual phone, but don't worry, it's in uh, do not disturb mode. And you know, there's no like secrets are gonna get uh, hit. All right, so now that the Firebase plugin is installed, well, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna give this a try. Now that it's installed, I'm gonna select the project that I want. Oops, that's, that's on there. Select this mobile app. Okay, now I just do ng deploy. So now, without any other configuration, the only step that I had to do between here was I had to set up my Firebase account 
and create that project, right? So it's not going to create the project for you, but I've already set up the project, but I have done no other configuration besides make sure it exists. So now that I've selected it, here's what's going to be super duper awesome. Okay, so now the production build is made. So it did the production build for me and now it's doing the deployment. So what's really awesome, I have something for you. If you wanna have some fun and a QR scan this, you can, get, you can get the application we just deployed right now. So I'll leave that up and I'm gonna scan it. All right, let's see if I can scan this thing. I got it. You got it. Wow, so I didn't just make that up. I, I'm being serious. It's actually a real application. Yeah. How fun is that? How fun is that? I need a longer cable. I was trying to uh, scan it in front of you folks, but my cable's too short. So I'm going to switch to a longer cable so I can also do it. And now when you go to that website, which I'm just going to show on my own phone as well, uh, when you go to that website, it's going to ask you, if you'd like to install. And if you install, we're, we're gonna have some more fun with this too. Let me show you what I mean. Okay, very fun. All right, all right, we should be back in the building. Okay, so let me go back and make sure that this is back. Okay, great. So this is like literally, you know, my phone. So thumbs up, so this is real time. Okay, so now if I can go back. Okay, so I'm gonna scan the same thing Okay, come on. There you go. Okay, super dope. So I just scanned the same thing. Okay, so now I'm on the app interacting with it. You can kind of see my finger like doing stuff. I'm like, you know, getting started here so I can like see that. But at the bottom of the screen, there's a little icon to just like install to home screen. So I'm gonna tap that, ask me if I want to install. And now it's gonna add this app to my actual phone. So now when I go back here, there is that Angular app that we just installed. But let's make this fun though. Like let's actually make this fun because come on, Mark, it's smoke and mirrors, right? So I'm gonna go to airplane mode. So this phone is now offline. And then I'm gonna still tap on that app. And then it still works offline. So my phone is currently offline and I still don't like oatmeal, but this works. Okay, super dope. All right, so I'm still not having a good time with the oatmeal, but this worked. Now, what did you notice though? I didn't actually make any code changes for this. And so if you have an existing Angular application, you can go and get this part working for you right now with just adding the package for PWA. And then I added, Firebase support so I could deploy it. And we have an application that works offline and has an icon that's installable on the phone. So that, that was pretty cool because this is gonna work on mobile and desktop for us, which is gonna give us a pretty big advantage. And then here's the other cool thing about this. This whole app was built using web technology that we already know. So if you already know how to build websites with Angular, you're reusing those skills, even for the UI components. Oh, one thing I didn't mention is that for this application to get this look, this is using uh, material design. So the animations are part of Angular and material design support. So that's pretty good. You know, it comes out of the box. I didn't have to configure that. And then it was very minimal, right? Code changes. And for this, I would have spent more time configuring the caching to get a really nice uh, experience. Now, if you're interested in more about like PWA, like in Angular and like how to do like a really uh, what I call like a bespoke experience. I'm actually giving a talk at ng-conf uh, this week and definitely check out that talk because I go into much more detail about setting up PWAs and how to really make the experience be that app-like experience we talk about. So this is all the good stuff, but what about the stuff that's not so good, right? Like, okay, you get things like lack of parity on Safari. And here's what I mean by that. Because the engine that's running the PWA is still the web browser, right? It's just support to have it installed as a PWA. It's still the web browser, which is going to mean that different web browsers, specifically <laughs> Safari, 
it doesn't have the same access to the browser APIs that Chrome, Edge, Firefox, and other support. So you might see a little bit of difference there. Then there's distribution, right? So I know that there are, there are, some, there are some PWAs that are distributed through app stores, but the number one way people find mobile apps is through app stores. So this way, they'd have to go to a website to find you. They have to know about you. So that's going to be a downside when it comes to distribution until PWAs get distributed through app stores. But here's the big value of it actually not being in the app store. Well, you've already seen what has happened with things like Stadia, where Stadia is a mobile app. It's a web app on a PWA on iOS to, to do the game streaming service. Microsoft just announced that their iOS app is going to be uh, a, a progressive web app as well. They're going to do a, a browser app as well to get their game streaming service on iOS. So there's this is a really interesting time for PWAs as people find out how powerful they are and what you can create. But distribution is still a thing. And then there's battery drain. This is the one that people don't necessarily want to talk about a lot, but it's still a part of the story. These PWAs are not optimized yet the same way that mobile apps are for resource use on mobile phones. Right, so this PWA is very lightweight, but what if we did something like the Twitter PWA app that is almost like feature for feature the same as their mobile app, but it's heavier in terms of like usage, not in terms of size, it's actually much lighter in terms of size, but battery drain becomes an issue. So you have to take that in consideration. All right, so that was Angular plus PWA. So we get to see how that worked out, but let's continue our story. Next, next, let's talk about this uh, technology solution. This one's called Capacitor JS. Now Capacitor is built by the lovely folks over at Ionic. All right, and what this is, is a spiritual successor to the web technology on mobile, like legacy of Cordova. So PhoneGap Cordova came out long, long time ago, and they were like the pioneers in this space that they said, look, we'll wrap your mobile app into a native wrapper, and then you can deploy that native wrapper to the app stores and get your app distributed. So uh, Capacitor is the spiritual successor to that project. And it's the same idea, though. It's native apps using web technology. And let's talk about what that means. This can be installed on desktop or mobile. Capacitor is actually a really excellent tool. Now, it can be installed on desktop or mobile as well. Then you see that it's built with web technology. So whatever you need to use to wrap your application in, you can use, you can bring your own tech to the party. You actually don't have to go with Angular, for example. You can use Vue or React because the capacitor is the wrapper for it. Okay. So you use your existing web tech and then here's where Capacitor takes a step beyond PWAs. Because of the native wrapper, it allows us to write code against the APIs through the, the bridge, right? Where you can say, communicate the interrupt bridge from JavaScript to your Java or to your Swift code. They have those uh, APIs already built in for you. So you can get access to the native API. If you can write uh, for iOS or for Android, then you can like build that bridge to get from capacitor to your JavaScript code. So this takes it a step, a step further. And think about in comparison to PWAs. PWAs are limited to what the browser can do. What the browser can do is growing, but it is not the same just yet. And for good reason, mind you, right? And for good reason. You don't really want your website to be able to do everything right, like a native app can do. So, so this is for good reason. So this, this is how this helps. All right, so let's talk about how the capacitor workflow is. I showed you what the PWA workflow was. Let's talk about the capacitor workflow. So first, you have to add support for the capacitor plugin with ng add. So we say capacitor slash Angular. All right, then you have to build your production bundle. And here's where capacitor takes over. You add your support for which platform you want. So is it iOS? Is it Android? This works on both, okay? And then you also have Electron for desktop. And then finally, you deploy your application to your device. So let's see how that looks right now. Okay, so that was, uh, is this our capacitor one? No, this is, no. Okay, this is our capacitor 
uh, application and I'm gonna show it to you. So I'm gonna switch branches of my project. All right, so let's go to a different branch. We're gonna do get checkout, uh, go to cat. Okay, very, very cool. Oh, I think that's gonna mess me up. I really should have committed those files before I switched branches. It's probably gonna mess me up, but I'll fix it because you know, this is a, a, a real talk. All right, I need my emulator again. Well, not my emulator, but my actual phone device. So I need this and we're gonna take this with us to our capacitor workspace on this side. Okay, very cool. So to run this, this is like using Android Studio. So I've already set everything up, probably broke it a little bit, but I definitely set it up before. And the same way you would work with a native mobile app, when you're ready to actually deploy it, you open it up in Visual Studio. And that's one of the really cool features of Capacitor. So let me show you how that worked out. So when I was in the Capacitor, hello, did I not? Okay, hold on one second. I thought I switched. Okay, get, give me that. Okay, wait, let me do my ad first. All right, very cool. All right, and then we're just gonna make sure we save all our PWA config. Whoa. Okay, very cool. So that was that PWA config stuff. Okay. Yay, feels good. Okay, so we can clear this out. Now I'm gonna go to get checkout cat. Okay, there we go. Now we're in the right branch. So if I were to do NPX cap open Android, what it actually ends up doing is just opening up Android Studio for you when you're ready to actually do your work and start, and sorry, when we're ready to deploy your application. Okay, so then, suppose I open this up and then I'm gonna just run it. Come on, oh man, I forgot about this. Android Studio is always doing a lot of stuff. Okay, let me close this because Android Studio. Okay, let's try it again. There we go, okay, so that's back. Okay. I guess this thing is not happy. All right. Oh. <laughs> All right, it's always an adventure. We'll, we'll fix this right now. So so I'll, what I'll do is just go through the workflow to show you how it works anyway, and then we'll do it together so you can see it's not all smoke and mirrors. So I'm gonna remove my Android uh, just for a second. So I'm gonna do our Android. So that just removed that Android part of the package that was uh, in there. So now I'll do NPX capacitor, and then I'll do copy Android. Oh no, I need to do add Android, I believe. Yeah, so I think I need to do NPX cat, I think it's add Android, okay. And because you are upset because, let me just make sure that any of these commands are working. Oh yeah, because you know, but isn't that what happens when you have a live demo that things just decide to just magically not work? That's been my experience. Yeah, yeah, there you go. I mean, what are you gonna do? It's kind of acting like you don't have capacitor installed or at least it doesn't recognize your capacitor installation maybe. Right, and so ideally, ideally I shouldn't have to do anything to make it uh, recognize. Okay, so what I should be able to do, hold on one second, I'm gonna do angular slash and then or so that's backwards, capacitor, mm -hmm. and then we'll add Angular. I'm just gonna add it back just in case because, you know. Okay, yeah, for some reason, I know that switching branches, the way that I did, remember I said I think I messed myself up without committing before I switched the branches to copy over some stuff and I think it just uh, messed up my uh, deploy, but that's not a big deal. That's not a big deal. We'll, we'll get through this part. Because it'll work, so NPX is supposed to 
like install on the spot, like in like memory. So you don't have to have it permanently installed. And the reason I don't like to have it permanently installed is because when I run this demo, I don't want it to come off as like, oh, yeah, he has everything set up. I want it to feel fresh. And so that's why I don't permanently install it. But that might come back to bite me later on. All right. Very cool. So now we're back in the building. Now we're back in the building. This is going to work now. So NPX cap add Android. Let's go. And now we can do NPX cap and cap is for capacitor. Open Android. There, look at this magic. I want y'all to look at this magic because there it is. And see, it's supposed to open this up like I <laughs> so uh, patiently wished would have happened the first time. Okay, very cool. Um, so this is opening the Android bundle that gets created when you add everything over, okay? So this, is, this should open up the Android version. Uh, Android Studio is doing the Gradle Sync right now, so that's gonna take a second. So while that's happening, just to uh, go back to what capacitor is supposed to, the advantage is supposed to give us here. It's supposed to give us that native feel in terms of the distribution and such. And it's cross-platform. So you're gonna get this for iOS and Android and desktop because the same way that I was able to add iOS, you see, I can also add Electron, which is a very popular solution for building stuff. Isn't Visual Studio Code an Electron app? I believe that it is, which is pretty pretty amazing that they built such a really cool tool on that. All right, I don't know how long this is going to be. Okay, we're ready. I got scared. I thought we weren't going to be ready. Okay, so I just hit play. It's supposed to deploy to this device that we have right next to us. And now Gradle is executing build tasks. All right. This should be pretty quick, though, because our application just doesn't have a ton in it. So this should be pretty quick. Okay, there we go. So capacitor is loading on my phone. And there you go. So there's our health app. And I didn't change the code here either. So again, if you're really interested in having an application that installs quickly, not install quickly, but if you're interested in having an application that is ready for mobile quickly, well, this is how I got there without going to the actual source code. So you actually didn't see me do anything. Everything was from the command line. So that's a pretty big advantage for you when you're using these solutions. And then I can go and interact and it's still the same application. So if this looks just like the PWA version, it's because it is. The only difference is, is installed as a mobile app, right? With the, uh, like as an APK file versus being installed as a PWA. That's gonna be the big difference. So. All right, so not PDW, but we look alike. Let's go. Feels good. And we still have the same version here. So you can tell that it wasn't the same app. So two different apps. Okay, because this one still has our oatmeal stuff in there. But the applications look quite similar. All right, very cool. We got that to work. You know what I need? Well, I'm going to do something for you. You see this hand? Put your left hands up because I got something for you. High five because we got through that together. All right, friends. So how does this measure up? Well, this is plug and play to the truest deg degree, right? I literally just installed the packages that I needed, set what platform it was for, and then said open, and then I ran. So that's plug and play. Still my same web tech. So my Angular skills are undefeated at this point. I've not had to make any changes to Angular directly to make this happen. This is working in our favor. And then if I wanted to do stuff like get access to Bluetooth location, which these things you could do in the browser, but let's just say for argument's sake, right? Bluetooth location, uh, ask for permissions, like all kinds of stuff that you do via programming. Let's say I want to write a plugin that accesses Touch ID on iPhone, right? Well, those platform APIs are actually programmed. Uh, a lot of those are already available from Capacitor when you include it in your application. So you can actually just add that in there and take things to the next level. Here's where things get a little weird though. So what are the areas that doesn't quite stack up? Well, this is not a truly native API. Like even when you looked at it, if you look closely enough, you could tell that it was still web technology. Like it looks a little bit like a website, even though it was in the mobile format, still looked like a website. 
But I will comment on this. I have an asterisk here because the team over at Ionic, they are doing a phenomenal job at creating their Ionic uh, UI library that does its best to really create as close to native feel as you can get without hitting that uncanny valley where it feels like this is close but not close enough, right? It feels really good and natural and very responsive, which is a, a good, good, it's really good on them. All right, <clears throat> here's the other thing. If you want to access more native features than what are available currently, right? And you wanna like say, oh, there's another thing that there's not a plugin for. Well, you're gonna have to write native code twice in this case, okay? So today there's an Apple event. Let's say that Apple announced some new API. You'd have to write that iOS code, right? And then if there's a parallel one in, and in Android, you have to write the Android code for it. Right, so anytime you wanna to get to a new platform feature, you have to write the code for each platform and then build those native code twice, which kind of goes against the whole point of being able to just take your web technology and run with it, right? So that's the downside, but there's a huge upside with Capacitor and I really like it as a solution. All right, now let's go to chapter three of our story. All right, now this one is native script. This one is native script. So here's what native script does. So native script is it's going to give you that truly native cross platform experience that you have been looking for. So if you are one of those people that say, well, my users can tell that this is a website and not a native application, they can feel the difference. I want that native feel with a native script. It's going to be great because native script is like capacitor in the fact that it allows you to bring your own framework to the party. We're bringing Angular, but with native script, you bring your own framework, which is really uh, compelling. Okay, so <clears throat> native script, here's the real magic. So each one of these technologies has a lot of magic. Here's the real magic with native script. You code against native APIs directly. I'm gonna talk about that in a second though. One is cross-platform. So you're going to find that, th that you can put your iOS and Android apps, one code base, both places, okay? Built with web tech, sort of, sort of. It's JavaScript or TypeScript, which is great. It's XML instead of HTML. XML instead of HTML because of their UI library. And then it's not a full CSS. It's a subset of CSS. That might be a deal breaker for some people, but hear me out though. Um, what you get for this is, like I said, this, the direct access to native APIs from JavaScript code. What I mean by that is, if you want a java.util.date, then that's what you type, even though you're in your JavaScript code. I know that sounds like complete magic, but the way they wrote this API, it's, it's really a thing of beauty that you could say, okay, I want an uh, iOS specific object. I would write like NS object, then what I want it. This is a, I'm telling you, it's really, really incredible when you see it in action. Um, okay, but here's how you get started with native script. <laughs> you start off by saying, yeah, I want the native script CLI from NPM. And then you do a whole bunch of other stuff after that. The configuration for this was by far the hardest for me. I had the most trouble getting native script set up. I think that there's just some, some really great opportunities for them to smooth out their CLI experience because as developers now, that is one of the things we look for is how the command line, you know, CLI experience is and the tooling is. I think they have some opportunities here, but let's look at how it all plays out, shall we? Okay, so here is our native script. So before we go into the application itself, let, let's explore some of those differences that I mentioned. Okay, so for that same home screen, this is the code that you'd end up with. Okay, so what's really important is just kind of notice that you have like some tags. So this is like, an, this, this is XML syntax, okay? But you have like an action bar and then you have like a stack layout and then you have your image and you have like labels and buttons. So this is a little bit closer to see if you ever used to do uh, Android development before. And you remember how the XML layouts were set up? So this is gonna remind you that. So if you know that format, this, this might feel more familiar to you, okay? But it still has like Angular stuff built in because look at this binding with parentheses, 
right? So we've got that event binding with those parentheses. And like this is a link to a class in TypeScript, right? This is my TypeScript component. So this part looks the same as my Angular code. Okay, but when I go to my component HTML, it's actually not HTML, it turns out to be XML here. And then, like I said, you can add styles uh, as you please, okay? When you're ready and you have your app like up and running, all right, here's what you get. So this is on my iOS simulator. All right, so I have like, you know, the home screen. You see that nice animation? You see how it just feels a little bit different? It's just a small, small bit difference, right? Now, I as a developer could have put in probably a little bit more work on the PWA versions to match this stuff, right? To get a little bit more parity there. But that's more work for me, right? Some of this comes, like this animation and the way it looks, this is built in from the jump. I didn't have to do anything extra to make it work like that. So those transitions between screens, that's all built in because it's building in, so these are actual native views. Okay, so, so you know, I like native views, doc. <laughs> that's what I'm telling my doctor. I like my native views. That's just a part of my story. All right. This is pretty cool. So now we have our actual native application that's installed, you know, via this thing. Uh, one thing they have on their tooling that I like that's pretty good is that if you want to forego like your native setup, like installation and everything, and you don't want to set up fuss with all the configuration, they have some tools called the Playground where it will sync your local app with a, a Playground app that you can go and then connect to remotely. If you've ever used React Native and Expo, it's along that line. So they have their own version of Expo, which says, hey, you know, ship our app to, ship the app to us, we'll give you a nice wrapper to the view on your phone without having to fight with the iOS build process where you have to pay them just to put an app on the phone, et cetera. So that tooling part is actually very, very good. So now how does this measure up in our story? Well, the native UI is beautiful. There's no getting around it as a developer who's looked at hundreds of mobile apps, hundreds of websites. I can tell the difference. You all can tell the difference. Can your users tell the difference? Maybe, right? Like if you have information that they want and the performance is good enough, maybe, maybe not. Code sharing. So the code sharing here is that I was able to still use my business logic, able to use my business logic for my application. So if you have good architectural patterns in Angular where things are separated into like services, et cetera, and, and you can really take a lot of that code and transfer it over and actually share it in a central project with your web and then your mobile. So you can have a, a code sharing uh, solution, code splitting, code sharing. And then, like I said, it's that direct platform API access that I definitely encourage you to uh, go in and uh, have a look at when you get a chance, because when you see it, I think it's really special. I didn't show it today, but when you see it, I think you'll agree that it's, it's worth uh, noting. Here's where things don't really uh, go in its favor. There, it requires a UI rewrite. So with capacitor and PWAs, I didn't change my UI. For the, our demo today, I had to learn a new UI pattern, new UI stuff just to make our application work. Code sharing is a benefit and a problem. The code sharing setup is actually quite uh, complex to get working, it's a little finicky. So. They might have smoothed, they, they probably will smooth it out over time, but right now it's more setup than I think you should have to have. I think they could, they, should, they could figure out a way to smooth it out for you, to be honest with you. And then the web technology support. So what I mean is that it's a subset of CSS and, the subs, and then it's the XML. So if you start using CSS and there's really cool features like CSS grid, you don't get to take advantage of those like layouts and things or CSS variables because it's a subset. So it's whatever they've decided to support. That slows you down a bit. Because again, remember I said I had to rewrite my UI, then I may have to update styles. I'm, I won't be able to port over styles easily either. Right, so that's a consideration to take. So this has been our mobile journey so far. We looked at PWAs. You can install your web app to your phone with Angular, little drama. Capacitor, again, not really a lot of drama there. We can get a phone app or with a native wrapper and still our same web technology not changing anything. And then you got native script. Well, we get rid of the web side of it, the web UI. We get this full, like, you know, the nice 
I would say, I don't know if it's 60 frames per second, but let's say it's 60 frames per second, animations and transitions and all the like platform things that our users would expect from using apps on iOS and Android. All that comes baked in and I can share my code. So the question is, well, which one should I use? Mark, you know, tell me an answer. Well, you're not gonna like my answer, but I'm gonna tell it to you anyway. Use the one that makes the most sense for you because it actually might make sense for you to do something with native script. It, it actually might be the best solution because of what you're looking for, what you're trying to create, right? Or you might get away with the PWA and not need this full, you know, like app experience that you will find with something like a capacitor. Or you might say, look, I just really need to access Apple Pay, right? The iPay API, and it's not for web, but I want to keep my rest of my app the same. The capacitor really makes a lot of sense for you, right? So you kind of have to figure out. But then if you want to stay on the bleeding edge of programming with your tools, I might say native script because every time that there's a new version of Android, a new version of iOS, they update their like API bindings and you can immediately start using stuff. You don't have to wait for like a wrapper to come out for it. You can just write the same code you'd write for iOS, the same code you write for Android, right in, right in your same Angular project. That's really compelling to a lot of people. So you have to find the one that makes the most sense for you. But no matter which one you choose, I still say go build great apps. Because at the core of it all, Angular was there to help you build your vision. Okay, friends, thank you. And I think we can have some time to talk to each other and ask, uh, ask some questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I, I'll get it kicked off with a question that I had. Um, I've done a little bit of um, React Native and you touched on this a little bit, but how does Native Script, how are other ways it compares to React Native? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the thing about React Native is that, so it's actually very similar to React Native because if you, if you ever use React, which I'm sure you have, but for people who have it, you use HTML tags in your render method, right, for your components. But when you go to React Native, you got to start using like the label and the view instead of your div, instead of your span. It's like the same style when it comes to the UI. Um, I don't know about React Native's like styling support, if it's truly the same or if it's a subset. Do you know about that at all or? Yeah, it wasn't real CSS. And it's like, okay. yeah, it's, it seems like a subset. <laughs> it seems very similar. Okay, so it's that same type of logic where it's like close. Uh, the thing with React Native versus Native Script. So there's still the JavaScript bridge that goes from React Native to your native UI components, right? Same thing here, but re, but Native Script took it a step further by instead of just giving you the bridge, they actually let you add new like new bridges yourself by just writing that code directly in your TypeScript or your JavaScript, which is I think is a big difference there. Um, you might find better community support for plugins and packages for React Native, if I'm gonna be honest. Uh, Native Script it doesn't have the same like a uh, wide community, but it has a very dedicated, this is one thing about these people, they're very dedicated to native script in a good way. They're super dedicated to it. So um, yeah, and they just joined an open source uh, cons consortium. I can't think of the name of the one they just joined, but that's how committed they are to like keeping the platform alive is that they just joined this major open source thing where it's like gonna stick around for a while. So yeah, I would say try it out for, try to redo a part of an existing app just to get a feel for it because that's how I was learning about all different technologies was I'll take the same app and try to redo the same part and see where I found the friction to see was it worth pursuing. Yeah, great cool, question. Mm -hmm. For the uh, native script, uh, for the XML that you use for the UI, now is it the mm -hmm. same XML for iOS or Android or does it differ? to an extent and how, how exactly does that work? Oh, great question, actually. Yeah, so it's largely the same, largely the same, but you can get specific and say you want the iOS version of this widget, right? If you need to call it out, but usually it's the same though, where it'll just take its general like stack layout and then it'll apply it correctly to iOS, apply it correctly to Android. So the UI Great ends question. up being similar to, ends up reflective of the platform it's on. 
Right, exactly, exactly right. Nice. It ends up being reflective. But you can do like platform specific programming if you need to. So I guess one question is, how does the Angular story compare to the Flutter story? Yeah, great, great question. So with Flutter, yeah, so Flutter just solves this problem a different way versus Angular. So with Angular, you're able to reuse, like I said, that your current skills with Angular. But with Flutter, you have to use Dart for one. And then for the Flutter UI, they actually don't use the native UI on the platform. Flutter is doing something very, very interesting. They, they redraw almost at the bare metal level, the UI components. So there is this own rendering engine almost, right? Where with these solutions, they're all saying, okay, you know, mostly there's either a web UI or a native script. There's the JavaScript bridge to control the native UIs. With Flutter, they actually redraw the UI. And then with Flutter, the patterns are different too, right? So uh, a lot of the parts with Angular, you have your structure with your components. Uh, you know, Flutter doesn't really use components. Everything's a widget, but a widget and component are not necessarily analogous because a widget does not really have logic associated with it, right? So the widget is more like the UI element when it comes to Flutter. Okay, and then Flutter uses Dart. There was a version of Angular Dart, but um, that's more used internally versus externally. Like there is still a public version of it, but you know it, it doesn't have the same traction, and, and people are focusing more on uh, Flutter instead. Because Flutter does have a web solution as well, but the Flutter web solution is actually a bigger bundle size because of the way that they build everything out, versus if you use something like Angular for for these things. That's if you're talking about Angular versus Flutter Web. If you're talking about like the mobile app space, a PWA is going to be like your smallest solution, right? Like in terms of if, uh, if you're looking at size of your bundle, your PWA is going to be the smallest, then capacitor, then you're going to look at native script. And same thing with Flutter, though, because it has a bundle, all of, all of its parts to it, it's going to be a bigger install right now. And then one last thing actually about, as I'm thinking about it, one other thing I'd say about Angular versus Flutter. Angular at this point in its career is, has been so well vetted and stretched by the community. Angular is built for scale when it comes to like applications of like multiple sizes. So if you fit in the space where, where Angular is gonna be a really good thing for you, for you as a solution, it scales with you all the way up because we have like, you know, huge enterprise partners where it scales and then Flutter, Flutter Web, I think that they're still developing those patterns and they're still, those patterns are still emerging right now. And they're still trying to figure those things out. So uh, Mark, your uh, mobile medical application, is, is that a future product or is it, um just a, a toy application for these sorts of presentations. So I am going to build it out to be more fully featured, but I'm, it's always going to be open source though. Yeah, it'll always be open source just so people can, you know, if it does become something that's helpful to people, because the thing that I try to like avoid it, uh, from presentations, because everybody does a to-do app and I feel like a to-do app is like, it's fine, but, you know, I just think it's if you can think so, something helpful. So hello world, I get it, yeah. Right, that's right, that's right. And so I think the mobile like uh, health app, you know, like the next generation of this thing, like persist the data so you can see what that looks like. And then, you know, you can do whatever you want to do with it. And just like I said, I'm gonna keep it open source though. So I, I have a pile of uh, medical records software. Maybe we should get together and talk. Let's, yeah, totally, totally let's do that. It'd be cool to talk about some stuff. All right. Well, thanks everyone. And thank you very much, Mark. This is totally awesome. Yeah, this is very cool. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. Thank the, you so options, yeah. much. 
Thank you. Thank you. I had a blast. Yeah. You folks Thanks, are a Mark. lot of fun. Yes, and good recovery when your command line tool failed. <laughs> I, I mean, but I, I knew it. I knew it was going to happen. Like, I felt it before I started. Like, this is going to break. I could feel it. Yeah, everyone who's used the command line knew what was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs>